ओम पवित्रम चरितम यस्या पवित्रम जीवनम तथा पवित्रता स्वरूपिण्य तस्यै कुर्मो नमो नमः या देवी सर्वभूतेशु श्रद्धा रूपेण संस्थित नमस्त 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 नमो नमः salutations at the holy feet of divine almighty my namaskars to all the professors and the lecturers of today's session till now in last eight lectures god willing i could complete all the seven criteria prescribed by our nac institute and a great set of disciplines that should be honored and properly implemented by our collegiate education educational institutions i mean now this is the ninth lecture and in next two lectures i mean to say ninth and tenth i want to concentrate much about how our teachers must equip themselves in making our children not only academically strong but also to help them to know the importance of education with respect to all facets of life that means to say as we say there is a notion of difference between literacy and education india is a great country from time immemorial this nation was highly respected by the foreigners we have read in the historical records written by foreign authors that india could attract thousands of foreign students to pursue their education in ancient indian universities and in addition to that it is my earnest desire to see that our teachers in our universities must have the knowledge of our motherland thoroughly that is most important because जननी जन्म भूमिश्च स्वर्गादपी गरीयसी ईज ए ग्रेट डिक्टम वी फाइंड इन रायण विच मीन जननी दट ईज अवर मदर जन्म भूमि दट ईज अवर बर्थ प्लेस दे आर् मोर् प्रशियस एंड वैल्युएबल दे आर् हईली रेस्पेक्टेड दैन दि हेवन इट सेफ this is the great belief the ideal before every indian so keeping that in mind let us have a research outlook individually to know about the greatness the grandeur and gaiety of our motherland india so in this connection i want to bring to your kind notice how the foreigners have viewed india because whenever we speak about science whenever we speak we speak about technology many a times it is really a great shock for our indian children our students and indians in general that whatever we have achieved was projected as very inferior compared to that of the western countries but this is not true as swami vivekananda rightly said every science had its origin in india but developed elsewhere you may ask me a question if india had all sciences within it why it got developed outside that is because of the social political reasons also that is a subject to be studied in the historical chapters but from time immemorial our country is well known 
for its knowledge and wisdom. Keeping this in mind, let us know about our country in the language and in the opinion of the Western scholars and great thinkers. Because more and more we know about our country in the purview of not only the native scholars but also uh, in the words of the Western scholars that gives us the clear picture about our motherland. I want to quote a British Orientalist by name Sir John George Woodrow. He says, an examination of Indian Vedic doctrines shows that it is in tune with the most advanced scientific and philosophical thought of the West. So British Orientalist very clearly says that Indian Vedantic doctrines they run parallel to the scientific and philosophical thought of the West. This speaks about how scientific and how philosophical our views were. Next, in a book called In the Vedic Gods, the author B.G. Rilay beautifully mentions about the greatness of Indian science. He says, our present knowledge of nervous system fits in so accurately with the internal description of the human body given in the Vedas 5,000 years ago. Then, the question arises whether the Vedas are really religious books or books on anatomy of the nervous system and medicine. This again makes very clear that Vedas not only described about religion and spirituality, it was all inclusive as it is rightly said Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda and Atharvana Veda are the four important Vedas and Atharvana Veda used to deal mainly with science and technology. So, B.G. Rilay says, if you study Vedas, it will help you to know more about the nervous system, more and more about our nervous system, about the human body, so he was astonished to say that can we confine Vedas only to a bundle of religious knowledge or is it a medical text also? These words of the Westerners, the great thinkers of the globe, clearly reveals that Indian concept of life, concept of education, I mean learning, and concept of health, science and technology, had an international reputation. I want to quote Arnold Toynbee, another great historian the world has seen. He says, in these circumstances, it might be forecast that in the next chapter of the world's history, mankind would seek compensation for the loss of much of its political economic and perhaps even domestic freedom by putting more of its treasure into spiritual freedom. This again speaks much about the enhancement of our knowledge with respect to political, economical and even domestic world can be enhanced by knowing more and more about the spiritual knowledge. So spirituality is all inclusive, I mean. See, again, there was a conversation between two great personalities. One was Burton Russell and another was Dr. Arnold Tynbee. The common question was, 
what is the only way of salvation for mankind button russell asked a question to dr arnold tynbe what was that question has man a future has man a future arnold tynbe immediately replied at this supremely dangerous moment in human history the only way of salvation for mankind is an indian way i repeat at this supremely dangerous moment in human history the only way of salvation for mankind is an indian way it is already becoming clear that a chapter which had a western beginning will have to have an indian ending if it is not to end in the self destruction of human race answer given by arnold tynbe is excellent and thought provoking yes we honored whatever the west said all these years but to have the restoration of human society and to avoid the destruction of the human race arnold tynbe says the only way left to us is indian way of life this again speaks about how india has viewed life what an amount of importance india could give to the human life at large so at this juncture india's spiritual gift to mankind should be properly mentioned about all these things i am explaining only to make us to know more about the contribution of india and the impact and influence of india on rest of the world how india could dictate words how india could shed light on different facets of human life uh, for the upcoming of the human evolution and the progress of human race arnold tynbe says he gave a talk to the philosophical society of edinburgh university in 1952 in which he predicted the cultural domination of india over the west in the 21st century india will conquer her conquerors not with weapons but culturally he says will durant another great historian in world history in his book the meaning of life says in the end we shall be an extinct volcano and asia with her faith in spiritual things will again mount the throne of the world so asian discipline of spirituality is the need of the hour for the whole world this is what the opinion the great thinkers historians orientalists they presented before us then in the meantime let us see what exactly the beautiful concept of evolution as we all know evolution is a moment from lower to the higher stage of development according to darwin we know various species developed from the tiniest cell called protoplasm and from protoplasm amoeba got evolved from amoeba it was fish later on a bird and ultimately monkey from anthropoid ape came homo sapien this is the beautiful postulate of evolution propounded by darwin but darwin could explain evolution from a particular point of truth he was very much corrected and his philosophy was made more clear by professor fredrich max muller 
once max muller said darwin himself went so far as to maintain most distinctly that his system of nature his system of nature required a creator who breathed life into it in the beginning that means to say darwin started defining his philosophy of evolution from the stage of the tiniest cell called protoplasm but at that time darwin also get convinced that i can explain from protoplasm to homo sapien but how did protoplasm could get life that is not known to me perhaps the creator has injected life into protoplasm that was his conclusion this again speaks about the origin of human or the beautiful philosophy of evolution how great it may be how truthful it may be but ultimately we cannot deny the existence of god and we cannot deny the great role played by the creator so without the concept of creator even darwin's evolution philosophy becomes incomplete at this juncture again in the context of indian philosophy we must define or we must shed some light on the concepts of religion and spirituality a western thinker gordon alport he says seeking religion with higher understanding and higher values constitutes mature religion when we respect higher degree of understanding and when we honor higher values that ultimately constitutes a matured religion that is why vivekananda says faith in god and faith in one's own self is virtue doubt is sin the different scriptures can only show the means of attaining the virtue that's all carl jung an analytical psychologist psychologist and a philosopher he says the ego is ill for the very reason that it is cut off from the whole and has lost its connection with mankind as well as with spirit man should not be egoistic this is the meaning of this statement man must have a life beyond the self when it is egocentric when he is self centered selter he cannot either individually achieve something great in life or he cannot do something favorable and some help to rest of the people in the society and it is being proved beyond doubt that many scientists philosophers and educationalists agree that a sensate culture without spiritual values lead to the fearful dilemma dilemma swami vivekananda warned the human kind by telling that excess of knowledge and power without holiness makes human beings devils to support vivekananda's words i shall quote the words of the nobel prize winner a poet morris metterling morris metterling says the greatest engineer mathematician physician or space scientist can be an exploiter or a senseless fool 
people sometimes don't observe this or even they may forget it this again speaks about the limitation of material science that is why india a great country which could propound great philosophy of religion and spirituality in indian context religion spirituality yoga education and meditation and even life they are all complementary to each other this is what swami vivekananda said but how is the pathetic condition of the world today so taking that into consideration we can we can come to a conclusion how in a difficult situation the world is moving through albert einstein in one of his lectures in 1946 he says a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move to higher levels the unleashed power of an atom has changed everything except our way of thinking unfortunately almost all scientists are economically completely dependent and the number of scientists who possess a sense of social responsibility He is so small that their voice is negligible this again brings to our kind notice that even scientific inventions the discoveries the scientists who did so many discoveries and inventions they were under the clutches of economically strong people and these economically strong people they never always thought about the social responsibility in the society they were very much bent upon the destructive works or to improve their business by selling the atomic weapons to so many countries in the world so as einstein said either the scientists were dependent on the rich people to get the finance to pursue the research or even though the scientists in a very small percentage had the sense of social responsibilities their voice and their number was so small that was not respectably and um, sincerely heard by majority of these people in the society all these consequences has ultimately led to again a dangerous situation in the world nobel laureate by name george world he made a shocking statement what is it killing has become a profitable business today see this is the way the world is moving killing has become a profitable business today we in indian context we say shanno astu dvipade shanchatushpade i pray for the welfare of not only the species with two limbs but also the species the animals with four limbs we always pray for the well being of each and every individual in the human society and every species on mother earth see this is what ultimately the life has taught us in india in the light of spiritual and vedantic philosophy we will find the mindset of every indian who prays for the universal peace at large సహనావతు సహనౌ భునక్తు సహ వీర్యంకరవాహై తేజస్వినావధీతమస్తు మా విద్విషావహై ఓం శాంతి 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 
if i say these are the prayers of our ancient rishis these were the doctrines preached by the spiritual saints and seers then immediately a question may arise in our mind was it really necessary for the survival of human at large yes to substantially make my statement a truth i shall get the help of the opinion the utterances of the western great thinkers i shall quote from the field of sports a great trainee a football coach late nut rocke from united states of america says that a player cannot have sufficient energy unless his emotions are under spiritual control so we must have a control by our spiritual energies physical mental intellectual strata of our body must have the spiritual control this is most important spirituality can control our entire different facets of our energies that is why a football coach of united states of america late nut rocke says in his own words i shall explain he was not willing to take anyone on his team who did not maintain a genuinely friendly feeling for everyone in the team he said i have to get the most energy out of a man and have discovered that it cannot be done if he hates another man in the team hate blocks his energy and he is not up to par until he eliminates it and depends on friendly feeling again the world has proved beyond doubt even in sports if i don't have spiritual control over my own capabilities and capacities i if i don't develop a friendly relationship with even my own teammates and even with the teammates of the opposite team i mean i cannot give out my energy in the fullest extent what an excellent psychology we come across here in the utterance of this great man nut rocke but and russell another great thinker says from evolution as far as our present knowledge shows no ultimately optimistic philosophy can be validly inferred so this philosophy of evolution mere evolution did not fetch us any life building philosophy for that matter that's why roma rola a nobel laureate who had greatest respect for indian philosophy sanatana dharma and who honored swami vivekananda and mahatma gandhi to a very great extent roma rola once said the foremost science in the world beautiful words of roma rola the foremost science in the world is the science of living in such a wise way as to produce the minimum evil and the maximum good possible 
so which is the science that is highly honored according to roma rola that science which helps us to produce minimum evil and maximum good for the human race william james another psychologist says every sort of energy and endurance of courage and capacity for handling life's evils is set free in those who have religious faith these are the utterances of the westerners again and again again and again i am quoting their utterances because indians need such guidelines very much very much that too after the invasion of the foreigners to india we lost all our great faith all our faith in our great religion and the whole education system was destroyed and ultimately just some literacy program was introduced to earn our livelihood but that is not education according to indian scenario i was going through a book titled the education in ancient india authored by professor altekar of banaras hindu university i was going through that book yesterday night it was so interesting when i went to bed it was almost 12 o'clock in the midnight and here in this book i came across the oldest convocation addresses in the history of human society one was in general that took place in the gurukula system of education and exclusively indians had a specific special type of convocation address even for the doctors in particular see i shall quote about both the convocation addresses in my 10th i mean the next lecture so indians were so specific with respect to specialization they were well known in the whole world see the belief in god faith in religion and spirituality is a must for human being it is beautifully said all right if you say religion has done so much of damage to the world if you say so then the immediate question is if there was no religion what would have been the fate of human beings that means to say the mistake is with respect to man and not with respect to religion we have the fanatics in religion and spirituality who have been branded as religious people and that is why vivekananda said there is nothing wrong with respect to religion and it is only the blunders of the fanatics that has brought a bad name to religion spirituality is a life of harmony unity and integration according to professor bright man as swami vivekananda rightly quotes man is the most representative being in the universe the microcosm a small universe in himself the wrong concept of life is the root cause for all conflicts in the world wherein the price of ignorance is heavy even today many of the intellectuals they don't know the clarity they don't have any clarity about religion and spirituality they they talk all unwanted things about idol worship they say all the religious practices are superstitions this is their logical conclusion but the thing is can't you accept that idol worship is the worship of the finite of the infinity don't you agree that the journey of evolution will start from known to unknown 
can't you accept that you are moving from lower truth to higher truth? Can't you agree with the fact that more and more the coconut plant grows, the old leaves will fall down? Something like that, as man grows physically, mentally, intellectually, morally and ethically, he will have a greater transformation, a reformation in his own practices, in his own beliefs and in his own thought current. This is what Dr. Georgi, who got Nobel Prize for inventing vitamin C in 1935, he says, a snake can grow only by accepting the process of malting. Malting is something like giving out its own old skin and developing new skin again. But of course, malting is a very painful process. If the snake doesn't accept the process of malting, it has to end up its life. Likewise, man grows from lower truth to higher truth in the process of thoughts, institution and antiquated ideas. This is what he mentions about. So this is the beautiful evolution. Whatever Jarji has defined as, the same thing has been put forth by Swami Vivekananda. Swamiji says, the dimension of our inner mind is shrunken and frail from lack of spiritual nourishment. Our outer life is blotted with overindulgence. Our meaningless secular lifestyles and single-minded material pursuits reflect a shallow spiritual dimension of life. Spiritual knowledge encourages values that motivate us to improve our human worth. The journey of human worth varies from lower truth to higher truth. That is what we call as by nature man is animal-like. By sadhana he becomes human. And by great spiritual practices he becomes a godly man. The transformation from the stage of animal to human and from human to superhuman is the journey of truth. Spiritual insight harmonizes and enriches our objective life. It helps us acquire positive, enduring values to live by. This is what exactly Swami Vivekananda guided. Let us have the utterance of Maharshi Aravinda Ghosh. He says, Bhagavad Gita is the greatest gospel of spiritual works ever yet given to the race, our chief national heritage, our hope for the future. I want to quote the words of Dr. Dil Muhammad, director of Lahore University, who happened to be a great thinker, well versed in Bhagavad Gita scripture. He thoroughly studied Bhagavad Gita and finally opined that Bhagavad Gita has shown him the way how to live, how to work, how to worship, how to pray and ultimately how to get faith in God and how to remain faithful to God. 
these are all the words of dr dil mahmud who was director of lahore university before i conclude the last part of my lecture today is about we must give a serious thought even with respect to the problems we are facing after independence this is the need of the hour yes we do agree that because of social and political reasons because of our own negligence about the great eternal truths of this ancient spiritual world the subcontinent india i mean we have suffered a lot but rejuvenation took place slowly india is coming back to its great pride what it had in ancient times at this juncture at this transition period ultimately it is the greatest role of our teachers in the universities and the educationalists of the society to make our younger generation and the populace at large to know much about what was the contribution of india how india suffered for a long time and now what is our responsibility for the restoration of the greatest heritage of this country okay keeping this in mind we shall we shall plan like this my dear teachers while you do your lectures while you speak about any important aspect invariably please refer to some most important contribution of india in that particular field that ultimately motivates our children to not only respect their heritage not only respect their motherland but also a sense of responsibility will be injected into their blood see we have tried our best through all the seven criteria to make our children physically mentally intellectually morally ethically strong and even in one of the criterion we have mentioned about the celebration of the national festivals so that they will develop national integration at another point of time we have beautifully defined the role of ncc nss red cross sections in the college collegiate education so that children will be made to know about social work to serve others in general i mean so every criterion insists us to have a meaningful and ethical existence of human society even we we have given much attention to uh, developing the libraries to a full fledged system so that our children can gain more of knowledge and wisdom by making themselves great readers and sincere social workers so to redesign india i request our teachers to shed light on the following aspects what i want to present before you right now and make our children to feel very responsible in those aspects i shall define it in brief today we know that india lives in a moral vacuum bold surgery is the need of the hour today the diseased heart of our nation that which was great once upon a time must get back to its healthy conditions and this can be possible only by injecting a greater system of education to our generation this surgery process is a very vast subject this should be looked as politically socially and economically keeping these ideas in mind let us think about say seven pillars as 
effectively described by Nani Palki Wala in his books, We the People and We the Nation. I request every teacher to go through these two volumes, most valuable, worth reading texts. I love those two books very much. In hundreds and hundreds of lectures, I have quoted the experienced utterances of Nani Palkiwala. He says, we shall develop seven pillars so that the country will be highly benefited and we can have definitely an improved version of our society in future years. The first one is, the first pillar I mean, sense of national identity. Very unfortunately in India, we identify ourselves only with respect to our states. We say, I am a Kannadiga, my friend is a Bengali, and he is a Maharashtrian. And many a times we say, we are the southerners, you are the northerners. Certainly, they will be the prescription for national disintegration. This is not the way one should recognize himself. However, hope springs eternal in human breast. We know our poets, our patriots, our prophets and our rishis, they loved India deeply and intensely. They have predicted that Indians will acquire a sense of national identity and unity in the foreseeable future. So this is being proved. Even one century before our independence, even 50 years before our independence, Swami Vivekananda could beautifully present before dependent Indians that India will be freed in another 50 years. We have a greater degree of responsibility to shoulder and we cannot sleep anymore. There is Jagrata in Bharatamata. Ultimately, the survival of India is very much necessary for the survival of the whole world, he quotes. Let us quote Sri Aurobindo, he says, I believe firmly that a great and united future is the destiny of this nation and its people. The power that brought us through so much struggle and suffering to freedom will achieve also through whatever strife or trouble, this aim. As it brought us freedom, it will bring us unity also. A free and united India will be there and the mother will gather around her sons and weld them into a single national strength in the life of a great and united people. These words of Aravindo should come into reality by the hard work of our great teachers. You only could, could you do this. This is what exactly the patriotic spirit every citizen is expected to possess. The second pillar is about Maintenance of law and order. An honest and efficient police force is necessary for our society. This should be fully insulated from political domination. We must have the police force autonomous like judiciary and Auditor General, General of our country. 
the department of police should also be autonomous it should be insulated fully from political domination the professional autonomy of the police force gets completely destroyed by political directives political influences and political interferences politicization of police must end a professional and honorable police force is valuable in every society we know in india the police force is not valuable to the extended expected extent for the three main reasons number 1 divisiveness see we have been divided in the name of religion language caste etc the second aspect is indiscipline it is somehow ingrained in indian character mainly we are all indisciplined very unfortunate it is we are excellent individuals but not the citizens of a cohesive society we behave with the total carelessness about public property we walk on roads rather than on the footpaths our motorists will make maximum noise of their horns in a silent zone these are some of the regular maddening manifestations of our total lack of discipline disorderly and undisciplinedly undisciplined conditions are very fatal to the developmental works finally the third aspect is non cooperation it is the other distressing feature people love not to cooperate with the forces of law and order in any section of the society it is not that easy to catch hold of a thief because people will never support law and order their cooperation for good deeds is minimal it is microscopic during pre independent days non cooperation was a valuable weapon asahakara asahakara was a very valuable weapon during pre independent days but the persistence of this habit after we became republic is most reprehensible very unfortunate it is people are non cooperative with respect to the good ideas of a good governance the opposition behaves as if he is an enemy country the opinion of the opposition is as same as the opinion of the enemy country this is very unfortunate pillar 3 implementing family planning see the graduate students of our colleges must be properly taught they must be properly taught about the importance of family planning family planning is not only desirable but amounts to the moral duty of government and people india can never make significant progress 
so long as the population keeps on increasing at the present rate the land will not increase in its size the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere so many the basic needs of man will not get enhanced but when population gets enhanced ultimately we face the problem of acute shortage of the most important things for our lively for our own survival i mean the fourth pillar is education education is the panacea for all human problems literacy is not enough we must know it is good to have a populace which is able to read it is good to have a populace which is able to read but infinitely better to have populace able to distinguish what is worth reading reading is general worth reading is particular we must not waste our time in mere reading we must be sharp enough to identify the to discriminate the reading which is really worthy value based education and qualitative education should become a national preoccupation next is pillar number 5 the constitutional integrity this is very important constitutional integrity differs from constitutional fundamentalism as nani palkiwala rightly said palkiwa i am quoting palkiwala's words while pakistan has gone in for religious fundamentalism india's besetting sin is secular fundamentalism the next pillar is egalitarianism india the poor house of asia today must become a power house at the earliest mr birla gd birla once said i am interested in anything that creates more wealth more employment i am a capitalist but i believe in a socialism which means equal opportunity more employment and fairer standard of living for everyone socialism does not mean socializing poverty but raising the quality of life for one and all wonderful words of gd birla finally pillar number 7 that is socially responsible business in ancient india king was called as shahin shah and the businessmen were called as shah king was shahin shah and businessmen were called as shah businessmen was looked upon with great respect and he was immediately next to the king people confidently left their property with the businessmen when they planned their pilgrimage if they died during their journey they were so confident that the businessmen would make a fair distinction among their family members if they returned they were equally confident that the businessmen could be trusted to return safely all their properties today the mall practices in business world have made society hostile to the class let the business community try to recapture that image of honor and 
integrity what they had in the past years of this great country these are the seven pillars very important and these are the most important aspects in which india has to progress to a great extent so my dear teachers ultimately you have to shed light on all those most important aspects and keeping this in mind i sincerely request all of you to thoroughly study the scenario and make the best use of this so that you can prepare a great generation for future india thank you very much for your patience listening jai ram krishna